President, <coughs> and gentlemen, ladies of the House, I, standing here with eight minutes uh, in my hands and uh, at this venerable and rather magnificent institution, I was going to assure you that I belong to the Henry VIII School of Public Speaking, that as Henry VIII said to his wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> but now finding myself... But now finding myself the seventh speaker out of eight in what must already seem a rather long evening to you, I rather feel like Henry VIII's last wife. I more or less know what's expected of me, but I'm not sure how to do it any differently. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps what I should do is really try and pay attention to the arguments that were advanced by the opposition today. We had, for example, Sir Richard Ottaway suggesting, uh, challenging the very idea that it could be argued that the economic situation of the colonies was actually worsened by the experience of British colonialism. Well, I stand to offer you the Indian example, Sir Richard. India's share of the world economy when Britain arrived on its shores was 23%. By the time the British left, it was down to below 4%. Why? Simply because India had been governed for the benefit of Britain. In Britain's rise for 200 years was financed by its depredations in India. In fact, Britain's Industrial Revolution was actually premised upon the deindustrialization of India. The handloom weavers, for example, famed across the world, whose products were exported around the world, Britain came right in. There were actually these weavers making fine muslin, light as woven air, it was said. And Britain came right in, smashed their thumbs, broke their looms, imposed tariffs and duties on their cloth and products, and started, of course, uh, taking the raw materials from India and shipping back manufactured cloth, flooding the world's markets with what became the products of the dark and satanic mills of Victorian England. That uh, meant that the weavers in India became beggars, and India went from being a world-famous exporter of finished cloth into an importer, went from having 27% of world trade to, to less than 2%. Meanwhile, colonialists like Robert Clive bought their rotten boroughs in England on the proceeds of their loot in India, while taking the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. Uh, <laughs> while, and the British had the gall to call him Clive of India, as if he belonged to the country, when all he really did was to ensure that much of the country belonged to him. <laughs> By the end of the 19th century, the fact is that India was already Britain's biggest cash cow, the world's biggest purchaser of British goods and exports, and the source of highly paid employment for British civil servants. We literally paid for our own oppression. And as has been pointed out, the wealthy Victorian British families that made their money out of, out of the slave economy. One fifth of, 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 the, of the elites of, of the wealthy class in Britain in the 19th century owed their money to transporting three million Africans across the waters. And in fact, in 1833, when slavery was abolished, what happened was that a compensation of 20 million pounds was paid not as reparations to those who had lost their lives or, or who had suffered or been oppressed by slavery, but to those who had lost their property. I was struck by the fact that your Wi-Fi password of this union commemorates the name of Mr. Gladstone, the great liberal hero. Well, I'm sorry, his family was one of those who benefited from, the, from this compensation. <laughs> Staying with India, between 15 and 29 million Indians died of starvation in British-induced famines. The most famous example, of course, was the Great Bengal Famine during the Second World War, when four million people died because Winston Churchill, deliberately as a matter of written minuted policy, proceeded to divert essential supplies from civilians in Bengal to sturdy Tommies and Europeans uh, as reserve stockpiles. He said that the starvation of any way underfed Bengalis mattered much less than that of sturdy Greeks. This is Churchill's actual quote, and when conscious stricken British officials wrote to him, pointing out that people were dying because of this, of this decision, he peevishly wrote in the margins of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? So all notions that the British were trying to do their colonial enterprise out of enlightened despotism to try and bring the benefits of, of colonialism and civilization to the benighted heathen. I'm sorry, Churchill's conduct in 43, simply one example of many that gave a lie to this myth. As others have said on the proposition 
violence and racism were the reality of the colonial experience. And no wonder that the sun never sat, set on the British Empire, because even God couldn't trust the English in the dark. <laughs> Let me take World War I as a, as a very concrete example, since the first speaker, Mr. Lee, suguested these things couldn't be quantified. Well, let me quantify World War I for you. Again, I'm sorry, from an Indian perspective, others have spoken of other countries. One-sixth of all the British forces that fought in the war were Indian. 54,000 Indians actually lost their lives in that war. 65,000 were wounded. Another 4,000 remained missing or in prison. Indian taxpayers had to cough up 100 million pounds in that time's money. India supplied 70 million rounds of ammunition, 600 1,000 rifles and machine guns, 42 million garments were stitched and sent out of India, and 1.3 million Indian personnel served in this war. I know all this because, of course, the, the, the commemoration of the centenary has just taken place. But not just that, India had to supply 173,000 animals, 370 million tons of supplies, and in the end, the total value of everything that was taken out of India India and India, by the way, suffering from recession at that time and poverty and hunger was, in today's money, eight billion pounds. You want quantification? It's available. Second World War, it was even worse, two and a half million Indians in uniform. I won't belabor the point, but of Britain's total war debt of three billion pounds in 1945 money, 1.25 billion was owed to India and never actually paid. Somebody mentioned Scotland. Well, fact is that colonialism actually cemented your union with Scotland. You know, the Scots had actually tried to send colonies out uh, before 1707. They'd all failed, I'm sorry to say. But then, of course, came union, and India was available, and there you had a disproportionate employment of Scots. I'm sorry, Mr. Mackenzie has to speak after me. Engaged in this colonial enterprise, as soldiers, as merchants, as agents, as employees, and the earnings from India is what brought prosperity to Scotland, even pulled, pulled Scotland out of poverty. Now that India is no longer there, no wonder the bonds are loosening. <laughs> now, we've heard other arguments on this side. There's been a, a mention of the railways. Well, let me tell you, first of all, as my colleague, the Jamaican High Commissioner, has pointed out, uh, railways and roads were really built to serve British interests and not those of the local people. But I might add that many countries have built railways and roads without having had to be colonized in order to do so. <laughs> uh, they... <laughs> they were designed to carry raw materials from the hinterland into the ports to be shipped to Britain. And the fact is that the Indian or Jamaican or other colonial public, their needs were incidental transportation. There was no attempt made to match supply to demand for mass transport, none whatsoever. Instead, in fact, the Indian railways were built with massive incentives offered by Britain to British investors, guaranteed out of Indian taxes paid by Indians, with the result that you actually had one mile of Indian railway costing twice what it cost to build the same mile in Canada or Australia because there was so much money being paid in extravagant returns. Britain made all the profits, controlled the technology, supplied all the equipment, and absolutely all these benefits came as private enterprise, British private enterprise, at public risk, Indian public risk. That was the, the, the railways as an accomplishment. We're hearing about aid. I think it was, uh, it was, it was again, Sir Richard Ottawa mentioned uh, uh, British aid to India. Well, let me just point out that British aid to India is about 0.4% of India's GDP. The government of India actually spends more on fertilizer subsidies, which might be an appropriate metaphor for that argument. <laughs> if I may point out as well. If I may point out as well that... Um, that as my fellow speakers from the proposition have pointed out, there have been incidents of racial violence, of loot, of massacres, of bloodshed, of transportation, in India's case, even of one of our, our last Mughal emperor. 
Yes, maybe today's Britons are not responsible for some of these depredations, but the same speakers have pointed with pride to their foreign aid. You're not responsible for the people starving in Somalia, but you give them aid. Surely the principle of reparations for what is for the wrongs that have been done cannot be denied. It's been pointed out, for example, the dehumanization of Africans in the Caribbean, the massive psychological damage that has been done, the undermining of social traditions, of property rights, of, of the authority structures of these societies, all in the interests of, of, of British colonialism. And the fact remains that many of today's problems in these countries, including the persistence, in some cases, the creation of racial and ethnic and religious tensions, were the direct result of the colonial experience. So there is a moral debt that needs to be paid. Someone challenged uh, reparations elsewhere. Well, I'm sorry, Germany doesn't just give reparations to Israel. It also gave reparations to Poland. Perhaps some of the speakers here are too young to remember the dramatic picture of Chancellor Willy Brandt on his knees in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1970. And there are other examples. There is uh, Italy's reparations to Libya. There's Japan's to Korea. Even Britain has paid reparations to the New Zealand Maoris. So it's not as if this is something unprecedented or unheard of that's going to somehow open some sort of nasty Pandora's box. No wonder Professor Lewis reminded us that he's from Texas. There's a wonderful expression in Texas that summarizes the arguments of the opposition. All hat and no cattle. <laughs> now... If I can just quickly look through the other notes I was scribbling while they were speaking. There was reference to democracy and rule of law. Let me say with the greatest possible respect, you can, it's a bit rich to oppress, enslave, kill, torture, maim people for 200 years and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> we... We were denied democracy, sir. We had to snatch it, seize it from you. With the greatest of reluctance, it was conceded in India's case after 150 years of British rule, and that too with limited franchise. Yes, indeed, ma'am. The opposition spoke quite highly of Greek and Athenian democracy on which the West should pride itself and spoke of liberty and equality in that same name. The Athenian democracy was only functioning because of the slave society on which it was built. That's the nature of colonisation. All right, I don't think that needs, uh, needs contradiction, not for me at any rate. <laughs> but but if, I, if, I may just, if I may just point out, I think the arguments made by a couple of the speakers, the first speaker, Mr. Lee in particular, conceded all the evil atrocities of colonialism, but essentially suggested that reparations won't really help, they won't help the right people, they'll be used as a propaganda tool, they'll embolden people like Mr. Mugabe. It's always nice how in the old days, you know, uh, I'm sorry to say that, uh, the, the people of the Caribbean used to frighten their children into behaving and sleeping by saying Sir Francis Drake would come after them. That was a legacy of that. Of that. Now, that now it's Mugabe will be there. So this is the, the new sort of Sir Francis Drake of our times. The fact is, the fact is very simply, sir, that we are not talking about reparations as a tool to empower anybody. They're a tool for you to atone for the wrongs that have been done. And I... I am quite prepared to accept the proposition that you can't evaluate, put, a, put a, a monetary sum on the kinds of horrors people have suffered. Certainly no amount of money can expiate the loss of a loved one, as, as somebody pointed out there. Uh, you're not going to be able to figure out an exact amount. But the principle is what matters. The fact is that to speak blithely of sacrifices on both sides, uh, as an analogy was used here, a burglar comes into your house, ransacks the place, stubs his toe, and you say, well, he, there was a sacrifice on both sides. That, I'm sorry to say, is not an acceptable, is not an acceptable argument. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this House is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. 
What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President.